Hey, what's up, guys? This is Brendan with Evoke Bike. We've got a super strong podcast for you today with James Walsh from Colorado. And I asked James on because he has a really wide and vast experience in a bunch of different endurance sports. And we talk about moving pretty quickly through doing marathons to Xterra competitions to world championships. Um, and how he was really checking the boxes and moving on to the next thing where he's landed on mostly gravel racing and mountain bike racing. And we go through everything from VO2 max training, how to race faster people, a couple of the big races like Gravel Worlds and SBT and uh, Unbound Gravel. Um, We get to talking about the kilojoule deep intervals what it takes for him to crack the top 10 in a big race is he's been pretty close. Um, Some good nutrition threads, everything from gels to pizza to gas station food, and really, at the end of the day, not overthinking the race, but having fun, which will lead to more results for you, which can be a really hard thing to do. I definitely struggled with that. Um, We get into recovery shakes, lifting. James is a big proponent of lifting heavy, injury prevention, human health, where to place the lifts around the races. Of course, consistency comes up. What's his favorite interval? And then just some tips for the people that have helped James get to where he's at as one of the top, I say top gravel racers in the U.S. He doesn't give himself that credit, but he's definitely a top 20 racer, a great bet if he's in a big race. So James, thanks so much for your time, man. This was awesome. And uh, we might have to circle back because I had a ton more questions, but we just kind of ran out of time. Thanks for your time. Talk to you later. Big do- <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, coming in hot with the background. Yeah, I'm on Zoom like all day long. So it's like, <laughs> I just got to keep interesting. <laughs> You're the first person to bring that up and bring one of those on. And you have an I Love oh. Carb shirt. Dude, you're just coming and swinging for the fences. <laughs> I think everybody like on my team uses Zoom. So like everybody, like everybody uses background in my company. So it's like. But dude, thanks for sitting down. This is, uh, yeah. I've been looking forward to this. And uh... yeah, we'll see. I just like, I just actually had to go into the office today for a few hours. And like I was driving back, listening to like your interview with Tyler. Williams and I'm like you're gonna have like this nobody dude on your podcast this dude time. <laughs> okay well you're definitely not that a is- no first of all you're definitely not a nobody your background in endurance sports from the first time that we linked up and just chat and we're like who who's who and whatever is super interesting and I think my biggest you know I like to even though it's cool that we're getting some professional athletes and these names that other people know it's good for people to see that like there's a dude doing what you're doing for your job. You're like, Hey, I might be a couple minutes late. I'm getting off the phone with my boss and you're smashing it. And like, you know, people that know you through me or through Vogue bike from on Instagram and follow your training are like, who is this guy? And then you've had some awesome results of big gravel races and we'll get into those, but I think it's just to have, I don't know, man. People, people have said to me, "Hey, you inspire me to ride a bike," and I'm like, "Dude, I'm nobody. So, right. you know, we're the same thing, you know." So people are definitely gonna be inspired by what you're doing. So I think it's when you message me that of, I don't know if people will be interested in this. I think it's almost this is maybe my last comment on it. A guy said to me, and I think I said I said this in another podcast. He's like, "The reason I think you resonate with people is you're not this crazy world tour athlete. You just do this right. every For day." Sure. And so, I mean, dude, you're the same way. It's like, you're either running or you're riding or you're doing this or doing that. And like, then it's like, oh damn. And he's got a daughter. Oh, and he's working and oh, okay. Maybe, you know, like, so I think, I think it's a different angle. It fits in even more. It's more valuable to people. So, right. Totally. Well, with that, I say easiest question. Who's James Walsh? Oh, dad, I've been doing, uh, endurance sports for like 15 years now, I think like, grew up with like no background in endurance sports. Like nobody in my family's like, my brother played baseball with me, but like, no, like parents weren't athletes. Like none of that And grew stuff. up like, where? In Southern California. Okay. And then I moved to Virginia for high school and then back to California. So, but now I'm in Colorado. Um, so yeah, I kind of got endurance sports on a whim. I kind of grew up playing baseball through college. Then 
transitioned to like just surfing, skating, snowboarding, mm. all through my 20s, living in Southern California. And then randomly just like jumped into a half marathon. Like the typical thing, like all my friends, I surfed with them. I used to surf like 300 plus days a year and like living with my friends. And they just like, I had a good job, like doing my thing. And like, they're just like smoking weed and surfing all the time. And like, I was like, I just, I got to just separate myself from this. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to run a half marathon. I've always was running and like lifting weights, stuff to stay in shape, like mostly just for surfing. Okay. But, and so I like, typical thing you know you find a training plan online followed it and then went out and like ran a half marathon and then i was like oh that was fun like and then i'm like i'm gonna get a bike and do a triathlon so i went and bought a bike did trap it just, it just snowballed from there like that's awesome i i wish that my story was as cool as as i decided to do a half marathon i rode a bike four miles and i was like dude that was pretty sick <laughs> And I, mean, I grew up like the first the first ride I mapped out was 16. It was in a square in Chicago and it was like four, 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 four. And I was like, that is so freaking long. I can't believe I just did that. So it wasn't a half marathon, right. but yeah. I, feel like, I think in baseball, like, cause I was getting ready to go to college to play baseball. So in high school, I ran a season of like indoor track. Cause like in baseball, it's like the six, your 60 yard time means something. To okay. college. So it's like, I went and like got on the track team and like, just to help with that. So in that point, I mean, I was always kind of a pretty good runner for not being a runner. Like, sure. like you like, you know, run the mile at school and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it came pretty easy once I decided to like kind of go for it. That's awesome. And so what's give your background. I got a couple notes from way back when we first started talking that you had highlighted tell me about this endurance background. Cause it's not just, you're the first person that's been in many different endurance sports. Some that I didn't even, I was like, I don't even know what Xterra is. Um, so what have yeah, you been hit, so hitting up? I've done like literally like everything. <laughs> um, so I like, yes, I started with like running a road half marathon and then I did one road triathlon. I was like, that was okay. But then I learned about this Xterra triathlon, which is like mountain bike and trail running. So it's like, typically like a 1500 meter swim, like a 25, 30 mile mountain bike, and then like a 10 K trail run afterward. That's kind of like the standard distances. So I jumped like straight into that. And then, cause I was having fun mountain biking a little bit. And then mm -hmm. yeah, my first big race, there's it used to be a huge series. I competed in when it was like, it's heyday. And it was like all over the U S is like it still a thing. It is, but it's like, it doesn't get the traction that, that it used it, to at all. It's no Iron Man. No, it's like that's kind of taken over, but it was a big deal back then. Like this whole regional series, like yeah. obviously Nissan like sponsored it. Like there were stops in like Richmond, Virginia and Alabama, like in, um, oh, we're in Alabama. That's like one of my favorite races of all time. Birmingham? Uh, it's outside of there. Um, yeah, it was like 99 degrees outside, 100% humidity, which is like my, that was like my, my jam back then. Like the heat is like always my thing. So I did that. Once I did my first race that, the big series, I got like second, like in my age group, whatever, which qualified me for like the world champs in Hawaii. So I kind of got on this snowball, just focusing on that. And then in just doing road triathlon and then doing some mount, or I mean, Xterra triathlon and then mountain biking to get better for that like mountain bike racing. Sure. So I moved up to like cat one for mountain biking, like all through that. And then in 2008, I won my age group at the world champs in Hawaii. And then I, after that, I was like, I quit trap on. Like, then I was like, then I like just wanted to race my bike. Okay. And I, what I was it? You, was it the training? Was it the actual event that you liked? You're just like, I just love the riding portion so much more than any other aspect of this or like, someone wins a world championship they're not usually like cool i'm good or maybe at least in my head i'm like i'm going for another one because i'm clearly pretty good at this i think like i always joke around saying that i have like racing and training kind of like add because like it's more of like okay check that off and i'm like okay what else can i do that's hard okay. right yeah and then so i went straight from mountain biking then and then and then at the same time got into cyclocross and then like ascended cyclocross really fast. Like I won a California state championship at like cat one mountain bike 
and Cat 3 Cyclocross in the same year. And then I worked up to go to Cat 1 at Cyclocross and like Cyclocross is still like, I'm going to get back to it this year, but it's still like, that's like, I love it. Like, I think you'd be good at that. And it's like, I've always been good at that, like on off kind of like Mm -hmm. punch it, sit in, punch it, sit in. And yeah. And then after that, I decided, well, I'd never done a road Ironman. So I'm like, let's try this. And that was like my first taste of like super high volume training. I hired this like old legend of a triathlete, this German dude, like old school German name is Dirk. Um, And he like through the ringer, like I was riding so much, like, I would do like on the weekends, like back to back six hour days. Yeah. Like the, the first day would be like, go out and like, there's, there's Palomar mountain in California. Okay. Know, I've ridden that. Yeah. And I'd go out and do like these, like, this is when I first started training with power too. That was in 2011. Okay. 2000. I had a power meter all of 2010, like an old power tap hub. Um, I kind of messed around with it. Like, you know, read the books, like, Mm -hmm. kind of like just this i basically just spent a year collecting like data of it right like just figure what the stuff um but then i got this german coach and he'd have me do these like power intervals like up palomar like he had like you know the old school srm you know they all had like so i'd do those and then that'd be a part of a six hour ride and the next day like it'd be a flat six hour ride on the coast okay and then wake up monday morning after two big days and go for a two-hour run Oh, you know, cause it's training for Ironman. And so it obviously worked. I mean, I went to my first Ironman. I was like, I think I was the second amateur and like, I got wow. a spot to go to Kona, like the world champs. So yeah, in 2011, I did like two Ironmans, probably like four half Ironmans, the Ironman world champs, half Ironman world champs. And then I quit that again. <laughs> I was like, triathlon's really not my thing. Like, like I balance two sports, but like, <laughs> just like trying to cram everything in, I was kind of getting over it. Yeah. So then I went back to just bike racing and then that snowballed. I was doing, I was doing a balance of like trail running and, and cycling. Mm-hmm. And then I remember it was like, I, I started getting into ultras, like running some 50 Ks, a 50 miler. And I was doing really well at that. And yeah. A hundred K you had mentioned, which I was like, what? Yeah. And then, but then in 2013, I remember it was just that I did the Belgian waffle ride in 2013. Okay. And I had a pretty good race. It's like top 20, but obviously it was like not as competitive as it is now. Sure. But I was like, but that's like riding all the same trails that we ride out there today on 25s. Like mm-hmm. there's like no gravel bikes. There's like, mm-hmm. it's straight up road bike with 25s, like on rocky single track, like so, but then right after that, I got hit by a car, like on my bike in 2013. I like, like got smashed. I was descending down a hill in California. I was going 45 miles an hour and the car hit me from behind. What? Yeah. Like it should have killed me. Like literally like, instead of like going into the ditch and like mountainside, I just oh, slid on the road. My God. And it like, yeah, I broke my collarbone, like all my ribs on the left side, like tons of road rash, but somehow like, man, I'm just good at crashing for mountain biking or whatever. Like I cracked my helmet and stuff and my bike was destroyed, but I like, I didn't even have a concussion or anything, which is wow. great. I mean, I had a good solid crack in the back of my helmet. Like it was just Damn, dude. destroyed and like, and then that was in Southern California. And then I'm like, I'm never riding my bike in Southern California. Again. I was like, there's too much traffic. Like I'm over it. Like, and then, so then I, I think all of 2000, after I came back from that, I just did ultra running. I rode my bike, I mountain biked a bit, just like, but wasn't really training. I was just like, I think it did end up doing like a six hour mountain bike race at some point in there or something. But, mm-hmm. and then I moved to Colorado in 2015. Okay. And then I was like, Oh, the riding here is unreal. Yeah. And it's like way less traffic. Like, I mean, where I live right now, I'm like a 10 minute spin from an You're hour. You're in Littleton? Long. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like Southwest Denver, like 45 minutes South of Boulder. Sure. Like back up right to like the mountains here. Like it's literally like a 10 minute spin to like an hour climb from my cool. front door. 
that just like goes up into the mountains and like it's awesome it's, like, it's rad so yeah and then got into that and then got back into bike racing in 2016 and then it's been all no more run i quit ultra running in 2016 okay and just been focusing on the bike again so it's been four straight years of focusing on like mountain bike and gravel now that's what I was gonna say. So mountain biking, gravel specifically, because uh, so he hasn't mentioned it, but has gone to DK twice, and in 2019 and 18 finished 20th and 21st, I believe, and yep. third in his age group both times. So he's an old man, 40 plus, 40 to 44, yeah. 43, <laughs> almost gonna be 43. <laughs> and um, but dude, 21st at SBT and second 40 plus. So like big results obviously age group wise but still getting in the top 20 at those races is pretty amazing um so yeah dude you have just this amazing like background of endurance sports what do you think through having done it for so long what do you think is driving you what is like amazing? i just i love the race man like i i really love just like get in there banging elbows and like i can always outperform like my training is always okay. Like it's pretty good, but you put me in a race. Like, I mean, I love the training. I like the whole process of getting fit and like all that stuff. But like, I love just being in the mix. And that's like, I would rather like go to a race like DK and like go all in to try to like, you know, crack the top 15 or do whatever and race like super, like take chances, follow the moves. Like totally or instead of being like conservative and like, finish 25th like I'd rather like I'm there to like roll the dice that's why I like to train hard is to like to actually show up in like race and like mm -hmm. that's why like I did road racing for a while and in Southern California it's all crits and it's all just like sitting in and I was like this is so boring like this mm -hmm. is like just sitting in for 40 minutes and then trying to win a sprint or like do whatever like I have like I just like just chase down everything like just have fun racing and like and be able to, like, I have no, like, preconceived notions. I'm not going to go to a race like DK and, like, beat Lachlan Morton or Pete Stetna or something like that. But, like, even to be able to, like, spend the first 100 miles in the front group with those guys, mm -hmm. like, is, like, that's what I'm there to do. It's just, like, I'm, like, I, age group stuff's cool, too, to, like, be the top 40 plus. But I just, like, in those races, it's, like, I just want to finish as close to the front as I can. Mm -hmm. And I know there's going to come a time when the big hitter guys, the real pro bike racers are going to like start lighting it up. And that's, that's like my time to be like, all right, guys, like you guys go have your race. I'm going to like have I don't know, my man. race. <laughs> I think you sell yourself a little bit short. I mean, I think that if you're already in the top 20 in some of the biggest races in the U S if you, one of my questions was going to be, what's it take to get to top 10? You know, I think, and we're all we can get into the nitty gritty of like some training things that when we started chatting about training you're like we we connected on vo2 max and gravel how like nobody really is like you got to train vo2 max for gravel racing everyone's like right. yeah just do like watts for a really long time it's like <laughs> right. yeah that's funny because when people that are better than you go really freaking hard guess what that's called it's called vo2 max and like <laughs> it, it's hanging on and that's exactly what happened in 2019. Like in like mile 30 of that race, there's a super technical run it out at DK. And just, I didn't even know the course, like nobody does, but I guess other people have like pre-written it more than they knew. And like right hitting that section, the front guys like all lit it up. Oh, and wow. I was kind of like off the back of like the front guys. I was probably like 30, 40 wheels deep out of still 100, 200 people together. Mm -hmm. and then it just flew apart people crashing left and right ruts and i remember like i don't know if you know who he is like pacing mckelvin like mm -hmm. he's like smasher mountain bike racer young guy 26 yeah. or something like he had stopped and i think go to the bathroom so me and him like the front group's like up the road from us i think it was like two or three minutes like over like 400 watts to like on gravel like to get back to that group yeah. and like it, like I mean, it's full on VO2 and yeah. yeah, we made it back and then it sits up and then it's like, Oh, there's only 25 guys left, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and we're like at mile 60 something. It's like they, those for, I know for me, cause like those guys just have more power than I have, but I'm going to have to 
have VO2 power if I'm going to make that front group. It's the totally. only way I'm going to make it. I yeah. can't just like ride threshold and like when those guys light it up because like their like tempo is like <laughs> my VO2. <laughs> so it's like, you know. Well, it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's to bring it down for other riders that are like, if we're, if we have like a guy who's a cat three right now listening. And I think there's this gap in the understanding of, People look at what everyone else is doing, but you need to be looking at who, how are you going to compete with the people that are already better than you? It's like so many people struggle to get out of cat three because they go do a one, two, three race. And there's like, all those guys are just faster than me. It's like, well, no, you need to start approaching this in a different manner. Like when, yeah, when they're doing threshold stuff, it might be VO two for you, but how can you draft better? How can you conserve more energy? How can you figure out what's the right move to go with. There's so many ways, but like, that's the game we're all trying to play. Unless you're the best in the world, everyone is trying to race with someone better than them. And like, okay. we just, we only focus on like, okay, well, I'm gonna do my threshold intervals and now I'm gonna do like my VO2 day and da da da. But like, it's really, when do you apply it and how do you shape it into your training to the event that you're going to do? When, as we're talking about events, like we're, there's gonna be 20 guys that are physically better than us. And it's like, okay, how do I, how do I sort through that? Because it's not just a, who's the strongest. It's when do you right. win those matches and things like that. But um, that's so interesting to hear. You gravel, Go ahead. Gravel, a lot of it comes into it too, because even like on the start line, like 2018 to 2019 at DK, like way more stacked, like in 2019. Like, I mean, I got up near the front, but it's still like, I'm behind like 30 to 40, like pro male bike racers, like, full on they have their team kits on mm -hmm. like and i'm just like but you see those guys get shot off the back left and right because gravel is different it's because it is like i mean the road racing tactics are all there but gravel is like it's a little bit different like it like it's like i mean it gets like full gas from like the beginning like it's like it's almost like mountain bike race style like that to where it's like it's like barely a neutral rollout and then it's like full on and you have these giant fields of like 2000 people it's just like it's, yeah it's, i've had some interesting experiences of like and really my biggest one that i'll do is gravel worlds i couldn't get into dk a few times i've tried to do the lottery and uh you know one year i went out way too hot and got caught was, like my i was i was at that race with you i remember <laughs> really <laughs> I bet I did it in 2018. I was like, who's this dude? Is this like, off in the 20, 2019. Yeah, I went up the front. I, I was trying to turn my light off. <laughs> Some people couldn't see how far off the run it was. <laughs> I got there with Tim Mitchell from CCB, who loves riding off the front. And um, Colin's old teammate, uh, who used to ride for Jelly Belly. He does the Flow Bikes TV. Yep. Yeah, I can't remember his name. What is that guy's name? Um anyways he was up there and some other dude and yeah we eventually we got caught and i got dropped from the group of four and this year colin came back with matt stevens and he ended up winning and he was like he rides by me and i'm so broken and he's like <laughs> epic and i was like more like moronic <laughs> i got off my bike at mile 120 and i was like I don't know if I can make this last 30 miles. It was so hot. And I was like, ah, made it. But so what I was going to say though, is that year was my, that was my first gravel race ever. The carnage in the beginning freaked the hell out of me, which is totally. one of why I went up the road. And I was like, there are people everywhere. It's pitch black out. This is nuts. I'm out of here. Totally. Whereas then, so I think I came in 23rd that year. The next year I'm like, okay, I'm going to be smarter. I realized I need to really, it, it's so funny to say, but when you're in the moment, I was like attacking at mile five. And I'm like, I think we can hold this for 150 miles. Totally. <laughs> Not realistic. So I'm like, I'm going to hang back here. So when everything was like chaotic in the beginning, I literally sat back a little bit and I was like, I don't even care what's going up the road. We're going to see you later. And it was like the chaos sort of weeded itself out over 10 miles maybe and then there was like okay. this blob of 50 of us rolling i'm like oh, okay that was yeah. much easier so i think it's almost like a gravel crit like if you're in the if you're not in the front and you're in the, the washing machine in the crit it's just like gnarly and that's right. kind of what the gravel that i had experienced this like early morning pitch black gravel 
Um, so, so for anyone who hasn't done a gravel race and you're doing one that starts at five and six in the morning, it is a little funky. Be prepared for that. Yeah. But um, I was going to say, I was really surprised to hear that the racing was the thing that drives you because you are such a training. I, at least I see you as a training, but you talk about your training on Instagram. You talk about like, and not every, everybody's not into that. Like you're like, Hey, I finished block three. Da, 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 this is what I did. And I'm like, Oh, this is cool. Like he's super I, into this, which is I'm more, I'm cyclist before bike racer. Like if I could never race again, I'd be like, Oh, it kind of sucks, but I, oh. Oh, I can still ride. Cool. Oh, for sure. But I wouldn't like, I wouldn't do intervals. I would still, I will still always ride my bike yeah. long and long rides and smash myself. But like, but like to me, that's like, I think like last May, like I stopped doing, I saw like the writing on the wall with like racing and not happening. It's yeah. so like, I stopped doing any kind of like um, intervals or anything like last May. I was like, I'm not, I'm just going to ride my bike. So I just spent all summer just like riding and running and just like having a blast mm -hmm. on the local stuff around here. But like, to really like train hard and go out and smash myself doing intervals. Like I, I literally just like visualize racing when I'm on the trainer okay. doing intervals. Like that's like to go to that place for me to like go hard like that. Like that, that's because of racing. Like I, I wouldn't okay. would go crush myself in a workout. Just see, I you know, like that. I like to just like, I think it's because also the, my average, like I'm such a cat five. I'm like, my average speed is higher and I burn more KJ. So I'll go do <laughs> intervals. <laughs> What's so we we're talking about, about intervals. We're talking about these big gravel races. What do you think you would add or change to try and get into the top 10? Um, and ignoring and, the fact of like, well, there's 30 pro bike racers. What do you think you would need? If you could pick something, even if it's something uh, that you maybe can't achieve, what do you think is yeah. like the missing? First of all, like I still do, like that is my goal. Like I know, I really think I can get like, no, no disrespect to all the big dogs out there racing that stuff. But like, I think I can like crack a top 15, like at Unbound, Gravel, DK, those races. Like Ooh, totally. Those race, I had like some problems in each one, like, I cracked a rim the first year, like smashed it and like, but whatever for training wise, like me and you have talked about this too. I've, I've never done them before in my life is like the fatigue, like KJ deep mm -hmm. intervals, like, and I've started experimenting with those, like, cause I can, I can make the front group like for the first hundred miles. Like I can cover the moves. I can mm -hmm. sit in, be there. But like when those, those guys have the ability that like at a hundred miles, like in 2019 or Colin Strickland won, he went at like, you know, around a mile hundred and went like full on threshold move on these people. And like, nobody went with him. And like, that's, even though maybe I'm not going to go with like him, but like the people that fall off that, if I can stay with those guys and get drug along even more, like, so that's just, I'm really good at those races. I've kind of like been in the front group and then fallen off. And then it's basically like, if you look at my power, it's like zone two to the finish. It's just like tons. There's no more, because I'm usually like in no man's land by that point or with one other person. Yeah. So I haven't been in a situation to where there's like surging or attacking late in those races. But to me, it's like, I need to make the selection out of the front group, right? I need mm -hmm. to learn how to like have the power when we're already like four hours deep. And then there's a little, you know, a little, another little break or something it goes up the road. I have the power fresh I know that like totally. fresh I can, I can do those and like it's it's the stuff like deep and so I don't I'm, know if that's like more mental or fueling or like some all, pretty good at eating on the bike like I can eat well, a ton you, you love carbs but you're not a huge carb person but home before we go down that one because I don't want to lose this but, thought so, so to boil this down though so for people that might not know that have maybe haven't listened to this channel before like KJ deep rides you're riding 2000 kjs and then doing your intervals 3000 kjs doing your intervals and i think a really great way for people to start this like doing some muscular endurance like do i have one workout that is like tempo finishers for riders that if a three hour ride is your long ride ride two hours and 20 minutes and then do like a 20 minute 90 percent ftp effort it sounds on paper like oh, that's really freaking easy go do it it's not super it, it has a different sting to it and then as you graduate and you move further down in your training, you know, do legit intervals, do threshold stuff. And like, there's a big gap between doing those two, but find what works and what stresses you. 
even my coach now, he's huge on these like end of the ride at hour four. He'll put in like an eight minute tempo interval. And I'm like, this is just enough uncomfortable that I'm kind of mad that I looked at the workout and I had no that right. I had to do this. Um, the other thing is don't sell yourself short, man, because like I always think back to, I always forget the name of this race, Fort McClellan is a road race that's now gone, but it was the last PRT road race. I came in ninth behind Greg Henderson, former rider from Team Sky, as you know, there's a five minute climb in there that we did six times, or whatever. Eric Marcotte, the last going into the last lap, there's the first my first interaction with the guy ever. Uh, he's like, big boy, getting over the hills today. And I was like, Eric Marcotte's talking to me. This is awesome. And then I got dropped. <laughs> But I hung on. I like I looked through the list of people that I beat that, you know, at any time on paper, I would not even pick myself against them. So, you know, it's the way the bike race unfold. A lot of lucky things happen to me. I held on for dear life at a lot of the right times. Also, who I dude, I was in a I am racing kit from Nashville, Tennessee. Nobody knew who the hell I was. Nobody gave a crap about me. You right. know, if they look at you and they're like, who is this guy and Wadi Ink stuff? Like there's so many dynamics. Don't sell yourself short on that aspect of it. But I think it is the KJ deep stuff is a mental, it's a mental mind block. Um, we're not used to turning on the heat at the end because we don't train it often. And then we go to these races and it's like, Oh wait, it's hour four and I have to go hard. Never done it before. Well, that's not a light switch that you're going to turn on. Nutrition right. is huge. Most there's definitely the camp that's like, I'm not going to eat the last hour so I can eat more when I get home, or I'm going to go into like fat burning mode, which I love that Stephen Bassett in an interview we did was like, well, people, please stop worrying about fat burning and fuel your ride. <laughs> and you know, the carbs, like there's no way around it, especially in a gravel race. Um, you got to eat enough. And so do you love carbs? Yeah, man. Like with, we've talked about this before. I've never done the full, like, to, like, I love your, like, on your, your blog, your whole nutritional post, like, sure. have that thing like, bookmarked. I think it's <laughs> rad, like, how it goes through all the, and I really think, like, I, racing, like, floodgates, for sure. It's, like, beta fuel, Martin, like, you know, 300 calories a bottle. I can, like, I can, like, take it, I think in those races, like, 20 gels, like, my gut is like rock solid in races. That's like great. Yeah, that's a lot of gel. Eating like it, DK, eating pieces of pizza, slamming Cokes, sandwiches. Like I eat like tons <laughs> of food. And that's why I think that's why I've been good at those races too. That like I don't, I'm not necessarily with the front group anymore, but I'm not slowing down as the right. races go on. Like I remember my first DK in 2018, like I was on fire at the finish. Like the last 40 miles of that race. Yeah. I like totally blew up at like mile 160, regrouped, smashed a bunch of food and was like smashing to the finish line. And like that same thing, with like Steamboat Gravel, like in 2019, like I got dropped from the group there because crazy aid station chaos stuff. Oh, but then I like so clawed my way. The thing about gravel, that sucks. Like when you get dropped because of an aid station, and it's like. And it was like self-supported aid stations. Yeah. And I, some lady ran away with my bottle. She's like, I'll fill it for you. And like, she disappeared. And then it's like, there oh. goes the group. <laughs> Dude. And like, but I was probably like in 45th, 50th place, like mile 75. And then yeah, clawed my way through like everybody on the back half of the race, just because I was like, just smashing food in calories. And <laughs> we had in gravel worlds, the aid station, like maybe 15 people were going up the road. And I was like waiting for the, they had like, I forget how I saw like two of the jugs, the Gatorade jugs. And I was like, <laughs> like, this is the race. I took the top off the jug and dunked my bottle <laughs> in and put it back on. And we chased, it was me, Patrick Wally and uh, Carl Decker, the mountain bike dude from giant yeah. dude. That was a match that we lit. And I think it was um, John Borselman was like, wow, you guys made it back. We're like barely. And then it was like later That's on, like, they were like bitching acting, at me to work and stuff. <laughs> I was just like, come on. Acting through the feed zone. Like that's like part of the game. Like, I guess it's, so. Which is like, which I don't like, I don't like it either, but it's like, if that's one thing you have to prepare for, for gravel too, is like, you got to get there early. You have, to have a, you have to have a plan, whether you have a crew that's handing you stuff mm -hmm. or any of that stuff, like you have to like, 
have a plan and know that if it's self-supported, it's going to be like every man for himself to like try to get to that cooler first to like fill their bottles. And I, I was actually thinking of the course, like I will race to the feed zone next year or this year if COVID passes and I go to that race. Um, while we're on the nutrition topic, coming from 15 years ago of doing races to now, what has changed? What, do you, what are some like interesting things that you've learned about yourself um, maybe even just like fuel more that you think other people should hear. Um, and maybe it varies a little bit from like Xterra triathlon stuff. Cause you got to run and you probably have, maybe you're eating different things or maybe that's why your gut is so trained for 20 gels. Like that's, I'm yeah. assuming that's what you have to take with, down. With triathlon and like ultra running and stuff, like you can't just smack, like, I feel like on the bike, like I really don't have an upper limit. Like I can okay. just, especially when racing, I can just keep piling the food in and like, I don't, it doesn't mess with my gut or anything, but that's amazing. <laughs> with like, yeah, a- anything and everything. Like I like, I'll eat like whatever on the bike. Burritos. <laughs> You're whole, I feel like you're holding back. You're like, I'm embarrassed to say this. <laughs> no, but like I always go, I love, like I ride long to eat gas station food, right? <laughs> like I love it. <laughs> like, I think it's so good. It's like, yeah, six <sighs> hour ride. You can, you know, smash a burrito, pick the, pick up from a gas station or something, whatever. But like, yeah. So I think like in the triathlon, well, triathlon is like just the nature of the sport. And I think people, and it's like probably way too much overthinking, like Mm. planning, like how many calories an hour do I need? And like trying to like basically have spreadsheets of like, I'm going to have this many calories right? This from gels and this bar. And like, then I get to the run and I have this. And I think like, I've just, for me, like way simplified it is I've gotten like, I don't, maybe because I've done so much. I like, I, it's not something I need to think about. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to like dump beta fuel in these bottles, gels in my pocket, smash a bar when I'm not racing full blast or going mm-hmm. hard. Mm-hmm. And just like, and I don't think about like, Oh, I'm going to, for me, I don't like think I'm going to get 300 calories an hour or something like that. I know about how many calories I have. And I'm like, just taking it all in and like knowing and like knowing I need to finish my bottle and do all this stuff. But like, I like, I get it all in. I probably get more than I'm even shooting for. That's important though. We got, I, I, I want to jump in because you, you, you said like, you're not really counting, but you know that you're getting it in because of experience. Like, you know right. that you're getting the 90 grams of carbs, you know that like, so for someone who's a newer cyclist, or if you can't look at your food and be like, yeah, this is enough for a four hour ride then you need to be counting. You need, cause totally. like, um, I think just ha- that's one thing that with your, I still count because if I'm doing a five hour ride, sometimes I lay stuff out, I'm like, is that enough food? I'm like, Ooh, that's only 400 grams of carbs. Like, and I'm doing a hundred an hour. I notice the biggest difference. If I'm like, there have been rides where I'm just lazy and I'm like, ah, 400, that's good enough. And like our four 20 hits. And I'm like, I wish I had more food. That was a bad idea. And um, I think it's a good thing though. And it's fun. It's interesting you bring up the nutrition post because I try to keep that updated with like just new information that comes out. Right. And like, it's very interesting that there's still stuff we don't know. Like there's a really good, I can't remember if it was a podcast or a post that the trainer road guys had put out where they're talking about how you can't really bomb the system with carbs. There's only so much your body can absorb. Whereas a guy like Asker Juke and Droop, he does not agree with that. And I was tweeting with him and I was like, yo dude, have, what's your thought on this? And he's like, your body is really smart. If your glycogen stores are not topped off, carbs will go there. And so I just think what you have always told me. And one thing that when we were working together on getting ready for some gravel races is when I have an athlete that like you, that has so much experience, so much in the relationship has to go of like, what works for you? Like we're more finding like, what can we tweak and optimize as opposed to like, introducing you to new stuff because your body already knows so much it's so used to so many things so that's kind of my tangent for the newer athlete listening to this like definitely experiment with what works for you on long rides get an idea so that you know like that knowledge is so huge because now that there's stuff out there like now that companies like science and sport put out like hey take 90 grams of carbs I'll have people that are cat ones that are like, Oh my God, dude, I'm taking an extra two gels every whatever. And I'm like riding like crazy. And I'm like, that's so nuts that people don't think about the fueling side of this. Um, and I think it's like, I've been, cause I've been in it for so long. I remember it was like, 
you know, 60, it was like 60 grams is like the top you could ever take in. Just yeah. Like, you know, all bogus now. But one thing I haven't done, this is like you said about like loving carbs. Like I've never done the full on carb loading. You, well, you did because I asked you to and you're like, I don't like that. That feel, felt weird. <laughs> but like, I want to like going to a race and like, because I really believe like another thing you post in your thing too, like this is what I've kind of done for years is like the whole like carb periodization stuff. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you have a hard workout in the morning, you know, carbs mm -hmm. for dinner, blah, blah, blah. Like, mm -hmm. and like, I know I have a good ride and I feel well when I get back from a long ride and I'm not even hungry. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's not because I'm smashed like that. I've been out in the heat or something all day. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, like I've like, I feel like, I've ingested so much sugar when I get home from a good ride. Like I know I finished strong. Like I am not like ready to smash food. Like I know if you like, if you like, I feel if you get off the bike in your long ride and you're just starving straight away, like obviously hours later that comes, but like, if you're like starving, you just can't wait to get home to like rip the refrigerator open. Then you like probably didn't eat enough on the bike. Like totally. I know when I like get home from six hours on the bike and I'm like, uh, I'm like not full because I mean that's not how like that kind of fuel makes me feel but I'm just like yeah I could I'll eat whenever I want to eat and the other thing we talked about too is like the whole like I think for most like athletes the whole recovery shake thing mm -hmm. is like such a waste in my opinion like mm -hmm. for a normal athlete who eats normal and is in a triathlete doing three workouts a day or whatever like I think you're gonna be pretty okay of just eating normal food like, yeah. after your ride, like have a sandwich or have your normal dinner with all this stuff. You don't need to like, I think we talked about before, like those are just like, I think that recovery shape is just like, and I know the trainer road guys, they preach about it all the time. Like smash it as soon as you get off the bike and, all that kind of stuff. and like, I'm like, to me, it's just that is like the extra calories and extra sugar, especially if like, I've been smashing gels and drink mix like on my ride and bars, you know, like all the ride food. The last thing I want when I get home is like a, another sweet yeah. fruit smoothie or. See, and that's the thing. So I didn't know that they were very pro about that. I had never, never drank. I didn't even really know about recovery drinks. And I was in Nashville and this was probably in 2016. And I got done with the ride with Patrick Wall. He's like, yo, dude, drink this. Like you need to be drinking this within 30 minutes. I was like, why, have, why haven't I been doing this? And he's like, this is the study. This is the window. And I'm like, I've been totally messing everything up. And then it's like, you'll talk to a guy um, like Trevor Connor from fast labs, the fast talk podcast. Yeah. He is very anti the recovery drink. And he's just like, yeah, dude, there's that study and then here are five more that say that like that window is a bogus thing totally and so i'm actually I, I i've gone back and forth and i think what i've landed on is the reason i've ever was pro shake is because it's almost kind of like a milkshake and i'm like oh this is kind of cool like i'm recovering it never <laughs> makes me full i'm Same. i eat way more uh or i should i eat way more because i'm including that I just prefer to come home and I do get hungry for real food at the end. If I'm doing a five and a half hour ride, I'm usually trying to say, so I usually bring like a little bit of candy, like Swedish fish or something. So it's kind of like more like real food. Cause I am a gel guy. I like gels and I like some bars. I actually eat cliff bars too, which some people are like, those are disgusting. Like I don't know, I like them. Uh, but that's also the thing too, that like you can find a cliff bar at any gas station. Anywhere. In the entire hey. Like that's, I use like SIS gels and cliff bars. That's yeah. like, that's my, my ride food all the time. I, you can get like four cliff bars for like less than five bucks. Like, Dude, totally. I mean, I'll buy them. I actually, I just discovered this store called Walmart when I was living in the country and that <laughs> stuff, I don't even know how they're making money, man. I'm getting avocados right. for 58 cents. Totally. Now I realize they deliver some stuff. So I've got Walmart coming here to Florida because it's kind of in the hood here and <laughs> I rolled up there in the afternoon. I was like, this place, you know, when they got security detailing the uh, parking lot, I'm usually like, it might not be worth the two bucks to come here. <laughs> but uh, so, but what I was going to say is when I come back from a long ride, like I'm usually planning a meal. I'm trying to, and even if it is, if I want something sweet, I'll be like, all right, I'm going to make this like acai bowl. I'm going to smash a ton of granola on top of it. I'm going to put some honey on it. Like if I want something sweet, then I'll make that. Or sometimes it is very, I'm like, Ooh, I want to make like a, egg sandwich with ham and like something more salty or like Mexican. But 
I'm with you. I'm trying to go more whole foods. I just feel, and I feel better after that. I don't, it, it kind of like, I'm a big person, a big, big fan of variation where it's like, I'm trying not to eat too much, just one thing. So to go crush 400 calories of this shake, that's like super fake. Um, right, totally. I don't know. Yeah. I just, I just found that the, like, that works for me. Cause I would do the same thing. I'd come home, smash a shake. And then 30 minutes later, I'm starving, starving. Cause I didn't do anything. <laughs> So I, wonder, I just kind of cut that out and I was like, I noticed no difference with like the way that I feel <laughs> like that recovery shake is not like, it's not even like a placebo effect. It's like, you just need some kind of calories, right? Like, yeah. So what, uh, going along with the training thread, what is you mentioned before that you were lifting for surfing? You're still a big advocate of lifting. You post all your lifting stuff, even on Strava. What's why, why lifting? And actually, like, why lifting? So maybe even just from the surf days, but how is it applicable to your riding now, especially for like gravel uh, stuff? I mean, I always just like, for first of all, like just general health stuff, right? Just be strong, not get hurt. Like even like doing all through my endurance sports, like I've always have lifted weights to some extent. Like I think it started off like when I first started, like more just like injury prevention, like lightweight stuff and mm-hmm. like just staying doing it and I don't know. It's like I progressed more into like just cycling and stuff. Like I've always lifted. I don't, I don't know. I've just, I don't know. It's kind of weird. Like when no, I, it's interesting I, because really- I don't know many people where like lifting was a thread of life for them. Actually more Pat Wally lifted in college. I know, but I didn't have any friends that lifted. Like I wish I lifted when I was in high school, I would have been a way better basketball. I mean, player. I, I did because I was playing baseball. So like, that's where I got like, baseball in high school and college got me into lifting weights like just learning the fundamentals of all that like so i mean i learned how to like with straight coaches in college like properly squat and deadlift and like yeah and that's like that's like a life skill right like for me those are like those lifts and like and for me it's like there's a direct direct impact on like the strength for me on the bike and it's for that because and i think also for somebody that's like yeah, maybe if you're a pro and you're riding your bike 30 hours a week or you're doing all this other kind of stuff, maybe, but like, I don't have that kind of like time to train. So like if I can, you know, train, you know, 90 minutes to two hours a day, but then also lift and build strength and muscle in other ways that like, cause I can't get on the bike, you know, like mm-hmm. go lift for 45 minutes and it's just made such a huge difference. And it's, for me, it's more than just like about like just bike racing or all that kind of stuff. Like I want to be like, just a strong human being and healthy yeah. and like and especially for like men too it's all proven like all good good hormone stuff like testosterone Dude, that's, all, i mean it, let's it, not beat around that bush i didn't like i didn't know any of the benefits really of lifting except it's like you get stronger but like the hormonal benefit is crazy i mean and it's like and i think with endurance sports like is bad for that and then the, i feel like the heavy lifting is good for you can kind of find like this balance for people you know? that can't read between the lines, like you do, if you train a lot, it's like, I don't really want to have sex. You start, li- you start lifting heavy and you get to heavy weights. It's like, yo, let's go. And totally. it's crazy. I mean, but then that, but all joking aside, that hormonal benefit of then growing your body to become a stronger cyclist is there too. Like the more, the growth hormone. And it's, I oh, mean, totally. once, I mean, the thing that I think that people don't latch onto it right away is because it takes away from riding time initially. And when you're getting through the adaptation phase of like doing body weight and like before you're actually getting to lift heavy, you're doing all the work to be able to lift heavy. People are like, this isn't doing anything. And they just are like, nope, I've put in my four weeks. I'm over it. And it's like, right. dude, put in like four months and then keep going. And I'm seeing now like, two and a half years in my growth now versus and like what like my maintenance lifts are versus what I was doing last year I was like wow I didn't know anything and like it feels different the way that I lift is my form is definitely much better um I'm excited to be five more years down the road it's just like cycling you think you knew a lot of stuff and then you do it more and you're like wow I'm way better at this Um, yeah I know for me like so my daughter's almost six right before she was born I bought like for the garage like all the bumper plates, barbell, you know, some kettlebells, like, and so like I've lifted at home for like the last five plus years. And like, I can and consistently probably like twice a week for, I mean, I was lifting before that, but I mean, for the last almost six years, just say like twice, 
twice a week on average mm -hmm. for six years and like this direct correlation like i'm strong like i zero injuries like never like mm -hmm. I've, I've never had a soft tissue injury like in my life like, wow besides getting hit by a car like that's yeah. like broken bones or like other details details um but i'm still like i still like getting stronger on the bike like at 43 years old and i like i it definitely have a lot of it has to do with lifting because like i told you i didn't do any intervals like i stopped in may last year mm -hmm. i still kept lifting all summer and riding like just zone two mm -hmm. probably top of zone two maybe all summer and then i got back into intervals in october and like <laughs> like my like ftp and power numbers didn't drop off at all like it's crazy i went from like 100 and something ctl to 50 like in wko like my my mftp went from like 320 down to like 265 because i just wasn't <laughs> doing yeah. anything hard yeah and like then i came back and like just like oh, i'm gonna set my intervals at 300 watt ftp right now and yeah it was just it was still there like it didn't go anywhere you do five three one lifting is that right? Yeah. I, I, this, my plan is five, three, one, like I've used a couple different, like hatch and Wendler, Wendler five, three, one. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do is use Wendler five, three, one, like basically like October through like, cause realistically racing out here doesn't start till May. Okay. DK has been my first big race. Like it's in June or Belgium okay. wealth ride in May. So I try to October, November, December, January, February, March. I do like five, three, one. Okay. And I try to get that one, like my max. Like I think like right now I'm like squatting, like right around 180 for like the, at the end of the cycle and like, and then deadlifting like in the mid two hundreds. But I like to get it to that to like, I don't really, this is my own personal philosophy. Like, no, that's why I, I asked you. Cause I was it, like, I've really, I, I have a follow up to this. I really worked to like peak power, right? And like, like one rep max and so six months of that. But then after I get to where like, yeah, I can do 175 pounds. I want to do like five sets of five of that. Okay. Cause I think it's like the time under tension mm -hmm. is like more towards like, like these ultra distance, like gravel races is because it's kind of like the same thing. You're under tension a lot of the time instead of like one big peak like one rep max, like I'd rather do 175, five by five, than be able to do like 250 once. Totally. Does that makes sense. That was so, actually, and then, sorry, go ahead. And then, yeah, I just, and I lift, I lift year round, like in back it off race weeks. I, I typically, like I've been listening to some of the stuff. I haven't traditionally lifted race weeks. Mm -hmm. I, that's the only week that I'll skip, but I've like, I mean, I listen to you talk and some of the other people you talk to and like, I'm this year, like, like, instead of like, yeah, doing five by five, do three by five, right? Like cut it down mm -hmm. the volume, but mm -hmm. keep that, like the strength training in there the week of the race. I don't think that's like a. Do a race sim, like go plan like a hard Saturday ride and do that on that Tuesday. That's kind of what was working for me last year. I, I cutting the lifting out for me and this is just i'm n of one i feel i've had better numbers and i feel better when i haven't lifted the day that i've when i haven't lifted the day that i'm doing that ride and i feel like last year in the beginning of the year when i was still i would say i mean i still consider myself a relatively new lifter i was leaving three days between a lift and then a race meaning if i lifted tuesday i would make sure wednesday thursday friday off and then race on saturday and I think even now I could lift on like Wednesday and recover in a couple of days. Um, but my thing is, so five by five is like your maintenance lifting. Am I picking that up correctly? Like that's what you're nice. go. It'd be more like three by five. Okay. Three because that's five good. In season. Because I've been trying to, so I do the GZCLP, the five by three, and then I cut their, they're like secondary lifts are three by 10. And I've been making those five by five instead because it just, I don't like a lot of reps. And uh, I've been having good like upper body um, success with that. And then I've been kind of trying to apply it to lower body stuff as well. 
And I don't know, it's interesting. I'm just kind of like trying to fiddle with stuff that feels good. And now's the time to experiment. And so I was just curious what you did. And it sounds like you find a groove that works for you. And, and I, I do it like, cause it's like the, the lifts, like squat, deadlift, overhead press. Like I, like, just like you, like I don't do bench press. Like yeah. I do a lot of push ups and pull-ups and kettlebells. I, need, I like doing push ups, And I was thinking, I like, I wish I had like just a little bit more pack, but I don't really want it for racing. <laughs> <laughs> more so um, than the beach but but i do like i i switched mine to like lifting like three days a week now instead of two okay. just because like racing still weighs off totally just experiments more so i do like one day now that's like back squat and i got uh got the hex bar the trap yeah. bar yeah okay. so i do a back squat and hex bar day and my other main day is deadlift and front squat okay. like traditional deadlift and front yeah. squat yeah and then another day of like overhead press and just some like accessory stuff. Yeah. Like it just, and like, I as much as I like lifting weights, I like to be quick. Yeah. I like to be out like 30, 45 minutes. Is, that's it. And that's all it takes. Yeah. What's, uh, what do you think is one small thing that's had a big impact on your training or racing? Ooh. Just, I think it's like, just being consistent for sure like that's like the number one thing i don't care like what kind of like training plan you follow like i mean i've obviously have years of years of years of like no major breaks like for like injury or sickness or like whatever but like just like the day of day week to week and like i kind of just do the workouts or when they come do them and kind of forget it like i don't big believer that like you know like no one workout's gonna make a training cycle or whatever right it's like like you always talk about it's like that week three grind right where mm -hmm. you're tired the intervals suck because mm -hmm. you're just like dead you're just ready to be done but like knocking that stuff out that week that's like that's where the games are made right like mm -hmm. the mentality of like just grinding through it i think mm. is i like that the biggest thing because it's like yeah the training's not always good but like you can't get like up about a good workout or down about a bad one you just kind of like and I have so much other stuff going on in my life too. It's like my daughter and work and all the stuff that it's like, I do it. And then it's like, okay, I got that done for the day. And it's time to move on. Dude, like, whatever, yeah. You know? So I don't have time to sit there and be like, oh, my workout was so awesome. I'm going to like crush this next <laughs> race. Or if it sucked, I'm going to be like, oh, I'm going to like, my next race is going to be terrible because I couldn't do that last set or whatever. Yeah. There is failure on the bike and it is really more, I think, because of the, just the precision of, I don't like, I got the precision of, it's not online and I want to make it sound like I'm anti online programs. It's the precision of like, everyone can know so much, but sometimes they just overly focus on the wrong things. Like I know for sure, when I look back, all I had was this paper when I was, I did a podcast with Frank Overton. Jason was a guy that worked out there that I was a teammate with. And I would get a dot doc X calendar that Jason typed in the workouts. Oh. And that's all, I mean, there was, we weren't using training peaks. They were using golden cheetah. I didn't know any of this stuff. And I was just like looking at this piece of paper, like, all right, Sam, I'm going to go do this. And then I would email him the file and he would email me a message back. Like, good job, bad job. Da -da, you should focus on this. But I wasn't like, I mean, there was no FRC. There was none of this. And I need to go back and look at some like old rides to highlight for people. Like, you know, Jane on Wednesday morning fails her workout. The whole weekend is destroyed now because she's a horrible <laughs> bike rider. And, da -da 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 -da. and I'm like, yo, this is one ride. Don't. And somebody was like, I take this from Gary V. Gary V, that's who it was. He was like, don't judge yourself on one day. And I'm like, that's such a, I need to like, just, I hope people pick that up from, from some of the conversations I've had with people. Like there's not a magic workout and there's not just go work hard. And I really like how you do say grind through because it's, I'm in some of these forums answering questions and people are like, Oh, is it, if it's too hard, just turn the percentage of <laughs> intensity down. And I'm like, or like, try a little bit harder and maybe you're not good at this and maybe it's something you need to work on and maybe you don't get a gold star today maybe today you failed and that's okay like and i was thinking i'm at, and i didn't post this video because i i usually don't re-watch stuff that i post like i just post it which is not the best <laughs> thing but i was on an endurance ride and i posted like hey this is hour three and i have two hours to go 
And this doesn't feel great. Like this, there's de definitely like, Ooh, something's going on here. This is when you push through. Like, this is when the gains are right. made. I rode three hours to be able to do this. And I was like about to post that. And I was like, I think I might sound like a dickhead. I'm not going to post that. And like, it just didn't come across the right way, but grinding through, like sometimes you just got to grind through and you did all that work to now reap the benefit from a little bit more work. It's just a little bit more, just push yourself that little bit more. Um, that's think, good for people to like, do. I hold myself accountable that way too. Like when I go out to do like intervals, like I'm really good at like holding myself accountable. Like, so I'll say it's like threshold, right? Which is like, I always give myself a range, right? Like sure. Yeah. say between 300 and 320 watts. And I know like, I know for me, like if I go out there and do the first one at like 315, I'm like, there's like no way in hell that I'm going to drop below 315 on the rest of it's like, it's just like a mental decision that I make. It's like, well, if you didn't, want it, to be this hard, if you didn't want it to be this hard, you shouldn't have gone out so hard in the first one. Like, <laughs> you should have, you should have dialed it back. I like, that's like the way I do. Like, that's amazing. I don't know. I just kind of like, like on Saturday, like I did, I just did four hours, but it like 30 minutes in two hours in. And then at three 30 in, I did 10 minute like threshold efforts. Yeah. And I think at 30 minutes in, I did like 315, two hours in, I did like 319, and then three and a half hours in, I did like 322. Damn, and dude, like, that's awesome. And I'm like, and I'm like dying, right? <laughs> like, yeah. But like a mental like switch in my head, I was just like, you got to like beat your last one, you know? Like, and it's, you can surprise yourself sometimes. Like you go out there yeah, and it's like, like oh my, it, I think if everybody, if you haven't had an interval session where you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe I completed that. Like, then you're not doing, you're not doing it right. Like there's that we can do so much more than we give our bodies and selves credit for that being able to go out on a ride like that. Those 10 minute efforts, those are good. I'm a big fan of 10 minute efforts. I don't know why. I just feel like there's so like, that's like me too. That's kind of like, I just like have my loops, like, and I always like, I don't know. I have this weird thing in my head, like 10 minutes, like four by 10, like, good. Yeah. Of like, whether it's like threshold, crisscross, over-unders, it's like, to me, it's like 40 minutes of work. Like my favorite thing is like do one workout a week. It's like four by 10, the other workout two by 20. Okay. Like, yeah. like they're both 40 minutes of work. Totally. Of course, four by 10s are harder. The, and like the two by 20s are like. Don't Variation, man. I'm a huge fan of that. It's like. And like the other thing for intervals too, I was just kind of like going off in nowhere, but like, no, this is good. One of my questions was favorite intervals. So it's all crisscross over under. It's like just mentally, like to know that like 15 minutes is broken up into like the different chunks instead of like, Oh, I'm going to stare at my power meter for 15 minutes and like hold it steady. <laughs> this, you know, this, this wattage or like surge recover surge. Yeah. Like I want to try the one that you've been talking about, like your, 120 and then at 90 for like yeah 18. like i was gonna say like build up that like that sounds like a rad one that i'm gonna have to try so i'm gonna do a podcast with my coach tom and that's why i was like i don't want to post too much about it like steal his thunder because these are his workouts but he's very not into straight power and he was like yeah we probably won't do that much so he and it's interesting they refer to like over unders they just call it lactate clearance you're building lactate and then you're clearing it and he has a bunch of different variations so far i think i've seen like three or four of them and then he has one that's just lactate tolerance you spike it and then you're riding straight power i like those i've always done those and i made a comment in a post with um craig and patrick the other coaches that i think it's because it's a, a very applicable to my style of racing but it's not necessarily applicable to everybody and so i think it's kind of, it's a good way to make it more entertaining for people. Like you're saying, like it's up, oh. down, it's up, down. And I had a guy that just did one um, that was similar. And I think he set like a nine minute lifetime PR on the way to a 10 minute interval, just because he usually doesn't go like 120%. I think his was like 120 and 93%. And he was just like, yeah, surprised I hit those overs and then fell right back into it and was like, you know, you're not dying, but you're definitely right. motoring along if you're going down oh, yeah. an MVP. Um, so once Tom, I don't want to steal all his workouts and be like, check these out, but I always, uh, I'm, I'm going to see what he puts together because he's got a good little, um, I know that they do actually sell like their workout library. Um, uh -huh. So I'll have to ask him about like 
I don't want him to be upset with me being like, check out Tom's workout. Oh wait, Tom, you sell these, my bad. <laughs> but he's going to come cool. on and we've got a couple, uh, I think a couple good topics that we'll talk about. Um, so I don't want to keep you too much longer. My last question will be, I ask you or someone comes up to you and let's make a gravel specific. You're going to teach a class on racing gravel in the U S what are some pillars of the education that you want people to take away? Or even we can just say it easier. What are some tips that you would give people? We've already given them aid stations. You know, that's part of the race, giving people the idea of like the, be the beginning can be super crazy. Um, and I'm going to steal some thunder from you. Maybe these KJ deep efforts are definitely gravel specific. Anything else that sticks out to you when we're talking gravel racing? Well, a non-training part of it is like, have at least a general idea of how to like work on your bike, right? Like mm. with tubeless tires, derailers, through yeah. axle, disc mm. brakes. Like make sure you have a CO2 in your bag because I definitely did a race with that one. That was bad. Yeah. So I mean, and like, yeah, I mean, I'm not a good mechanic. Like I, I pay people to work on my bikes yeah. <laughs> for sure. But like, I know how to like, you know, cause a lot of people with like these days now with like disc brakes through axles, blah blah just like take him off put him on get into like if you depends on if you have like your kind of derailleur if you have like like the stop clutch thing like it does on SRAM you can take it out like just being familiar with like taking your your wheels off your bike and like the mm -hmm. basics not even like being like a good mechanic but just like yeah because like odds of flatting and stuff in those races are way more like it's going to happen eventually know how to use like a tire plug like you know like the basic stuff that's like a that. good one but like, and it's like, you don't even need to be like a great mechanic, just the, all the basics. <laughs> like, you, cause like the, I told you like the first year at DK, I was in the lead group up to like mile 95 and I squared up on a rock and smashed my front rim. Oh. Like ceiling shooting everywhere, oh, cracked yeah. rim. I was able to mess with it and get the tire to seat on just enough that I could like ride, ride it. Like, yeah, like I'll, I'll send you a photo of it. It's gnarly. <laughs> But I was able to ride to the next aid station. I had brought a spare wheel set with me. So I could be able to swap my front no wheel. Way. Okay. So, but I mean like the basics like that, like not like I know what I'm doing. I'm like, I'm gonna try to seat my tire and like not panicking. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was crazy. Like we were off it took like 10 minutes till a rider passed me. Like we were so far off the front. Yeah. It just kills me. Like <laughs> I mean, that's that's the thing that like if you and that's I'm gonna steal this one of you know if you are going for a result and you're saying hey I want to make top fifty which is great um, you know try to stay with the lead group because they will take you far I mean dude gravel that's worlds when I got off my bike and I was like oh this sucks I was thirty miles from the finish and finished twenty third I believe and I was just like I'm on the course right like I haven't seen people in a while. Well, but just like the group was gone and that's like that's my strategy like against the guys that i race against who maybe aren't as willing to like go super deep vo2 max in the first 50 miles to like yeah. my goal is to let those guys drag me along for as long as i can hang with them because i know that i can like kind of regroup smash a bunch of food even if when i eventually get dropped <laughs> like yeah but I'll, i will be so far ahead it's crazy like that was me. My nutrition tip, actually, I forgot about that. When you were talking about being able to eat a lot of different things, like I, as carb pro as I am, I'm like a very uh, carb variation. Like the night before, I'm like, okay, I got bread, and then I want like sweet potatoes, and then maybe it's a little bit of sugar, and then like fruits, and then in the race, I like gels. I'm not a huge as as much of an SIS fan as I am. I don't really care for Beta Fuel because then I can't eat as much. It's too sweet. It, yeah it's just it doesn't i don't know something's weird but so i like the regular drink, like, powder and then candy that has invert sugar i was actually talking to justin bold very briefly we made a like joke he saw my swedish fish and he's like i love sour patch kids and i was like they both have invert sugar i think that is the secret because you look at some candy it's just huh. corn syrup which i don't want that but right. swedish fish it's invert sugar it's just like a different molecule or something it's not like it's like a different molecule like uh hydrogenated oil like it's plastic but it's i don't know i it's to probably totally bs but me and wally are like get that invert sugar dog and uh coca-cola is huge at the aid station 
And then um, if they have pickle yeah. juice, I, I like the extra sodium. Yeah, I think I drank like eight bottles of beta fuel mm. in my compound. And yeah, I don't, I don't think I've had it since. Like, <laughs> that's a lot of beta fuel, dude. <laughs> like diabetes or something. Um, so much sugar. But yeah, the other day is like just, just like eat. And like for long gravel stuff, like you have to like learn to eat and like, you know, and while you're going hard, that's like, I think the hardest part is like, yeah, on a training ride, it's super easy to be like, oh, I'm going to smash this cliff bar. But I can't tell you how many times I've like put a cliff bar on my map and had to like spit it out. Cause I'm like trying to breathe and eat. And I just, yeah. can't. that's why I've like, the truck racing is a lot of just drink mix in like gels for me. And then if I get the chance, then I will smash some real food, but it all depends. Like, but it's so different, like in the race scenario. Cause I always have that plan too. Like, okay, I'm going to take these bars. I'm going to eat them. And then I'm like, not a chance. I can yeah, dude, down. people are throwing punches. It's just like, whatever I can <laughs> gel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, seriously. And like all plans about the winning. So like, Everybody's got a plan yeah. until they get punched in the mouth or whatever Tyson says. Totally. And just like, so, yeah. Other for gravel, just like ride gravel. Like <laughs> mm. I've been I've been taken out in races by plenty of dudes that like can't ride their bikes in gravel yeah. so far. Like I think at Gravel Worlds the first year, that's how I got detached that year, like a mile 80. Some dude crashed me out mm. in that one. And so yeah, just ride your bike in gravel. Don't like let it be like, oh, I'm training all day on the road and then I'm gonna go jump on my gravel bike and go try to race in a group because it's different sitting in a group in gravel totally. than it is sitting in a group on the road because you still have to be like hyper aware of like the terrain you're riding on you're not just like you know sitting in you have to like because you're still pedaling rock you're not really coasting behind somebody and chilling and just breaking yeah yeah if you hit like a little pocket of sand like you know a gravel world it's like there's like those pockets of sand where it's like it's super loose Mm -hmm. and if like you're in you're three across and like the middle guys fishtailing all over the place like <laughs> you know <laughs> dude what's uh I'm, I'm actually just curious of this last question do you have any race routine anything specific that is um like helps you get dialed in maybe mentally or physically food wise or are you just like you've done this so long that it's kind of like second nature you're just waking up and it's race day it's kind of second nature and I've kind of like, I think I used to like be more that I like, this is my pre-race meal. Mm -hmm. This is my, you know, the night before meal, this mm -hmm. is what I'm doing. And I think I've gotten more flexible over the years that like, right. Sure. I don't let that be like another like cause of stress. Like, yeah, like, yeah, it's like, you know, it's the, whatever I can have if I'm traveling for a race, like, yeah, I can have like, a bagel with peanut butter or a bowl of oatmeal whatever i can get my hands on or like right. the night before the race i know if i'm like eating a good amount of carbs and a lot of food that like i'm happy with that it doesn't need to be some like i eat sweet potatoes and brown right. rice and chicken that's like my yeah. thing if i don't have that i'm like thrown off <laughs> or, or it's like this in the same thing with like race food too i've like tried so much stuff like i don't like if they have an aid station, I can grab stuff. Like I'm yeah. about it. Like I can handle whatever they can the throw at. I'm not gonna like worry about. There's just like this one magic gel that this is the only one that works for me. So I have right. to carry 25 of them or whatever. Yeah. Like it's just like not letting that. Like there's so much other stuff that goes into the race with your gear and like all that kind of stuff. To like, I guess just not having a routine really in that sense of like just eliminates some kind of stress for me. Other people are probably the exact opposite where they're like, if I can't control it, then I'm stressed. I'm more That's like, what I was gonna I say. Care. It sounds more like you're just more about eliminating the negativity of like stress and cause stress is horrible. I mean, stress is gonna make you race worse. Even if you, if you stress out about getting all the right gels, you probably have a worse performance. <laughs> than well, if you just... And I'm just like, just super jacked to race. So like, I just love that getting on the starting line. So like, Man, that was a huge thing that I, who was just talking about this? Oh, uh, Tyler Williams about having fun. And I was so serious when I first started racing because I was so hungry to like upgrade to get my cat one and to like, we we're creating this team and da, da, da. And I don't know, I think once 
I just was like, I'm just glad to be going to do this and this adventure. And I was on a team with a really good group of people. And it was like, okay, this is just a weekend. And we have this bike race, as opposed to when I first started, it was like, got to get at least in third place. Cause then I'm gonna get this many points and then I'm gonna have this many. Cause before when it was the road calendar where you had only 12 months, there was a little bit, there was much more pressure, but like you had to get on the podium if you wanted to upgrade. And uh, yeah, I just, I think I look back, I'm like, man, I, maybe if I just chilled out a little bit and not been so like, Meh, I probably would have gotten it faster, but. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I thought, I think like a race, but cause like, obviously like, 43 with all the racing i've done like i'm not like racing for like a result like ever these days yeah. like i'm not like obviously i want to do as well as i can and i know if i'm like <laughs> it's close to the front of the bike race that's where i want to be but like that's not why like i mean the, i like the act of racing not like okay. i don't need like oh if i don't if i'm not like top three 40 plus this is this is like that's not my goal going in there my goal is just finish as close to the front as i can and let it all take care of itself and just like have fun doing that because that's like why i went and smashed my face doing all these intervals and doing all this stuff i just get to go out there and smash on the race day and just see what happens and like <laughs> like it's like i think it's probably been in like the last five years like it's total like stress-free racing for me like it's mm -hmm. like i just have fun and it's the results will take care of themselves for me like Cause I know that I'll work hard to get there. I know that right. I'll show up on the day, like mm -hmm. fit, ready. I've done everything that I know how to do to get ready to race. Mm -hmm. So when I get there to race, it's like, there's, I don't need to think about like anything else other than just like, let's go have fun. Like, yeah. That's why I, think, I, do it, right? I think that's one reason why I like do, trying to do as big of and hard of race as possible. Cause then I put less pressure on myself. Whereas like when it's a local road race and it's like, there's a pretty good chance that our team can win. It's almost like you're racing to not lose. And totally. while I wish I could say I was the mindset that I was just going to have fun. I definitely mm -hmm. am still like, no, I want to win. Like I want to, I want to try and win races. And I'm actually getting like, this will be my last year is 39. I'm going to 40 plus, And I'm like, I can almost do masters at every race to every promoter out there, please put the masters road race and the one, two, three road race at different times. So I can go race like 120 miles in a day. Cause I got to do that one time. It was so awesome. The guy was like, are you really doing both road races? And I was like, yes. And he's like, yeah, totally. they will literally finish and start. And I was like, I have two jerseys with different numbers. I'm right. literally like start the race. And people tried to gun it in the master's race to drop me. <laughs> like <laughs> get the jersey on. <laughs> it's so funny. Totally. Like, it was awesome. But and I think dude, by, like gra the gravel stuff too is like, it's like so much like, I mean, to go out and race 150 miles, like these big events, like, it's so I like, I mean, I love the classics, right? And there's no amateur bike racing. There never was when I was like coming up, like, that are like, are like the classics, you know, like mm -hmm. Paris-Roubaix and Flanders mm -hmm. and all this stuff. Like gravel is like the amateur's chance to do these like 200K races on this like gnarly terrain and stuff. And like, see like, like true endurance, right? Like see what you got at 130 miles, you know, like anybody can like some guy can come off the couch in a 65 mile road race and like ride his bike twice a week and he can sit in all day long. But like, you know, you get over hundred miles, 120 miles. That's going to like, I don't know. Dude, you, can't you, get to, like, you get to 80 miles in gravel, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. And it is like, it's a, you can tell who's trained for it and who hasn't. The group just right. whittles from that distance. It's uh well, dude, this is awesome, man. There's a ton of I've been starting to call them L's. Like people always say L is a loss, but great lessons <laughs> and tips and insights from your myriad of adventures in endurance sports. And I hope that if racing comes back this year, we get to have a coffee or something at a race when we cross paths on a knobby tired bike. And uh yeah, I mean, yeah hopefully. Man. I'm hoping racing happens. Like we'll see though. Like gravel worlds, hopefully. I'm hoping. I don't know. I'm really curious. Um I with all these new strains and people that I, that are much more involved in like the vaccination world than me are like, well, 
you might be able to get a vaccine, but then you still got to be careful because of this and this and this. And I'm like, dude, so when am I racing? They're like, I don't know. It might not be a long time or it might be a long time. I was like, oh, we'll see. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Totally, man. James, thanks, dude. This was awesome. Yeah, right yeah. on, man. Well, we'll talk in soon and uh, have a good rest of the week. All right, Tady. All right, see ya.